Good afternoon, Baker Babes. I've missed you so much. I thought every day I would take some time and I would read you a little book. I thought it might be kind of fun. It might be a little getaway. So I chose the book, Hello, Mrs. Piggle Wiggle. And I have to tell you that I used to read this book when I was your age. And she's one of my favorite characters. Let's see if you can figure out why she's one of my favorites as I read. And I'll read a chapter each day. Hope you can tune in. This book is called Hello, Mrs. Piggle Wiggle. It is the first one of this series. First chapter is called The Show Off Cure. It was a beautiful morning. A bluebird sat on a small branch in the flowering cherry tree and swayed gently back and forth. A crocus pushed his golden head through the tender green grass and, it, and blinked in the sudden sunlight. Mrs. Carmody hummed as she laid slices of bacon in the black iron skillet. Spring is my favorite time of year, she said to Mandy the dog, who was lying in the kitchen doorway, scratching a flea and waiting to trip somebody. Mrs. Car Carmody plugged in the toaster, got out the raspberry jam, and then went to the front hall and called upstairs to her husband, Jordan, breakfast, and to her little boy, Philip, are you up? Philip, who was 10 years old and still under the covers, called out sleepily, practically all dressed, mom, be right down. Constance, his sister, who was 11 and three quarters, yelled from the bathroom where she was testing how lipstick would look when she was 13. Philip isn't even up yet, Mom. He won't be down for about 10 hours. Philip shouted, old spy, tattletale. Constance said, be quiet, little boy, you bore me. Mrs. Carmody called again louder. Philip, get out of bed this instant. Connie, wipe off that lipstick. Hurry, Jordan, dear, while the toast is hot. She went back to the kitchen and gave the percolator a little shake to hurry it up. Then she walked over and stood by the open back door, breathing deeply of the fragrant early morning air. Her pleasant reverie was suddenly broken by Mr. Carmody, who came grumpily into the kitchen, tripped over Mandy, and stepped heavily into her water bowl, which was on the floor beside the stove. Mrs. Carmody grabbed the sink sponge and began wiping up the water. Mr. Carmody growled, well, that's certainly a nice morning greeting. Mrs. Carmody said, oh, Jordan, dear, I'm so sorry. Did you get wet? It doesn't matter, said Mr. Carmody mournfully. Nothing matters anymore. What do you mean nothing matters anymore? Asked, asked Mrs. Carmody as she squeezed out the sponge. Just that, said Mr. Carmody, sadly pouring almost the whole pitcher of cream on his shredded wheat biscuits. Are you sick? asked Mrs. Carmody, peering anxiously about uh, peering anxiously at him. I'm guessing she might have given him a look like this. No, I'm not sick, he said, or at least I'm not physically sick. Just sick at heart. Mrs. Carmody buttered the toast, put the plates in to warm, stirred the eggs, lifted the bacon onto a paper towel to drain, checked the color of the coffee, refilled Mandy's water bowl, then said, what in the world are you talking about, Jordan? You don't make sense. He makes sense to me, said Connie, flouncing into the kitchen, because I feel the same way. I'm so ashamed I could die. What in the world are you talking about, said Mrs. Carmody. Are you ready for your eggs, Jordan? I suppose so, said Mr. Carmody dolefully. Quickly, Mrs. Carmody took the plates out of the oven, divided the eggs into four equal portions, added a dash of paprika, laid on four strips of bacon and two pieces of toast, carried two of the plates to the table, and snapped them down in front of her husband and daughter. Now, she said, folding her arms, tell me what this is all about. Connie picked up a piece of bacon and began nibbling at it. Well, she said, if you really want to know, I do, said her mother. Well, Connie said, the point is that Philip is ruining all of our lives and you won't face it. Ruining our lives? Philip? asked Mrs. Carmody. Don't be ridiculous. I'm not being ridiculous, said Connie. Philip is such a disgusting little show off. I'm ashamed to bring my friends home anymore. What about last night? He disgraced poor daddy. Mrs. Carmody gazed at her daughter intently for a minute and then said, Connie, you've got lipstick on again. Go upstairs and wash it off. Oh, honestly, Connie sighed heavily. Every single girl in the whole United States of America wears lipstick but me. 
I'm just a freak, a poor freak with a disgusting little brother. Yes, yes, I know, said her mother. Now go up and wash the lipstick off. When she was sure she could hear Connie's furious footsteps on the stairs, she turned to her husband and said, Now, Jordan, dear, what is this all about? Mr. Carmody said, Meg, Philip is an obnoxious little show-off. Last night was the worst I've ever seen him. And Bob Waltham is my most important client, and frankly, I wouldn't blame him if he never came to this house again. Oh, Jordan, said Mrs. Carmody, laughing. Philip was just trying to be entertaining. Do you call putting a whole baked potato in his mouth entertaining? Do you call drinking an entire glass of water without stopping and then choking and turning purple and spitting water all over the table entertaining? Do you call looking cross-eyed, touching his chin with his tongue, wiggling his ears, standing on his head, reciting the alphabet backwards and forwards and sideways and upside down entertaining? Well, I don't, and neither did Bob Waltham. Now, Jordan, said Mrs. Carmody, you know that Bob, Bob, Walth Bob Waltham is a stuffy old bore. You said so yourself, and after all, Philip is only 10. He's just a little boy. You shouldn't be so hard on him. You mean he shouldn't be so hard on me, said Mr. Carmody, angrily ripping a piece of bread in half. Meg, something has to be done about that boy. Now, today. Feels like a hot mess, doesn't he? Just then, Philip came rattling down the stairs and skidded to the breakfast room. Hi, Dad. Hi, Mom, he said cheerfully. Morning, said Mr. Carmody grumpily. Good morning, Philip, dear, said Mrs. Carmody. Philip sat down, grabbed the sugar bowl, and began dumping sugar on his shredded wheat biscuit. Not so much sugar, honey, said his mother. Philip added two more heaping teaspoons of sugar and then dumped the rest of the pitcher of cream on his cereal. Looking brightly, eagerly at his father, he said, Hey, Dad, want to watch me put this whole shredded wheat biscuit in my mouth all at once? I do not, said his father. Not even if I whistle Dixie with it in my, in my mouth? No, roared his father. Eat your breakfast, dear, said his mother, putting a fresh pitcher of cream on the table. What if I, Philip began. Stop talking, bellowed his father. Connie, who had come downstairs, was standing unnoticed in the doorway and said, what a repulsive little show-off. My gosh, mother, can't you see how disgusting he is? <sighs> My gosh, mother, can't you see how disgusting he is? Mimicked Philip in a high squeaky voice. Maybe I should try that again. Oh my gosh, mother, can you just see how disgusting he is? Mimicked Philip in a high squeaky voice. Mm, she said something that wasn't very nice. I'm not going to read it to you. She doesn't like her brother very much. Now, children. Mrs. Carmody gent said gent Mrs. Carmody gently. Mr. Carmody glared around the table and said fiercely, I want absolute quiet. My gosh, Dad, what's the matter? asked Philip. Are you sick or something? Yes, I'm sick or something, said Mr. Carmody, savagely grabbing a spoon from the raspberry jam. I'll get you aspirin, said Philip, sliding out of his chair. I'll get two aspirins, and I'll carry them the way down I'll have to carry them all the way downstairs on my nose. Watch me. Sit still, said Mr. Carmody. Sit still and eat your breakfast and don't talk. Well, okay, said Philip, but you don't have to be so crabby. Be quiet, yelled his father. Philip gave him, a, gave him a reproachable look, sat down again, and began to eat his shredded wheat biscuit. Mrs. Carmody brought her plate and Philip's from the kitchen and sat down. She looked out the window at the pale pink cherry blossoms and the clear sky and the fat bluebirds swaying on the branch, but she no longer felt happy. She took a sip of coffee, which was lukewarm, and looked around the breakfast table. Philip was eating busily, but the minute she looked at him, he grinned broadly and whispered, Hey, Mom, want to watch me balance my cocoa cup on my forehead? She smiled, shook her head, and motioned for him to be quiet. Even if it's full of boiling hot cocoa, she shook her head. Even if it has a spoon in it, she shook her head. What a bunch of crab patches, Philip said. Quiet, bellowed, bellowed his father. Philip reached for the jam dish and began sulkily emptying it onto his plate. When breakfast was last over and everyone had left for work or school, Mrs. Carmody heated up the coffee, poured herself a cup, and sat down at the table to look at the morning paper. Just as she opened the paper, the corner of the eye caught a glimpse of something white on the floor under Philip's chair. She reached over picked up a small folded piece of paper. She opened it up, smoothed it out, and read, Dear Mrs. Carmody, 
I'm having a little difficulty with Philip. Will you please call me at your earliest convenience? Sincerely, Edith Periwinkle. Mrs. Carmody looked at her watch. It was four minutes to nine. Perhaps she could get Miss Periwinkle before the bell rang. She hurried into the hall and dialed the number of the school. When Mrs. Miss Periwinkle heard Mrs. Carmody's anxious, worried voice, she said, I didn't intend to worry you, Mrs. Carmody. It isn't anything serious. It's just that Philip has become quite a, quite a show off, said Mrs. Carmody. Well, yes, said Mrs. Periwinkle. I guess that's the right word. I also must admit that he's very entertaining and his little schoolmates think he's very funny and laugh at everything he does. Unfortunately, he no longer confines his antics to recess and the schoolyard. So I have to take steps, which is why I wrote a note. Well, said Mrs. Carmody, I should have seen it coming because we're having our problems with him at home too. Have you any suggestions? Yes, I have, said Miss Periwinkle. I think you should call Mrs. Pigglewinkle. You've heard of her, haven't you? I've heard the name, said Mrs. Carmody. Is she some sort of doctor? Oh my, no, said Mrs. Peri Miss Periwinkle. She's just a very nice little woman who loves and understands children and has a very magic way of curing their bad habits. Her telephone is Vine Maple I-2345. Just a minute while I get a pencil, said Philip's mother. Of course, she couldn't find a pencil, but she did finally find a broken green crayon with which she wrote down Mrs. Pigglewiggle's telephone number on the back of the gas bill. Mrs. Carmody's hand was shaking as she dialed the number, but Mrs. Pigglewiggle had such a warm, friendly voice that Mrs. Carmody got right over her nervousness and told her all about Philip. Mrs. Pigglewiggle laughed and said, isn't it a shame that children can't be all evened up? I mean, some are show off, some are shy, some are quiet, some are noisy, and some laugh too much, and some cry too much. Oh, I could go on and on, but loud or quiet, shy or show offy, timid or boisterous, children are wonderful, and I love them all. So do I, said Philip's mother, and actually, Mrs. Pigglewiggle, Philip showing off doesn't bother me. But his daddy says he's obnoxious, and his sister Connie says he's disgusting, and this morning his teacher, Miss Periwinkle, told me that he is getting out of hand. Well, said Mrs. Pigglewiggle, if it were only his older sister who complained about Philip, I would be inclined to let, let time work things out. But as long as Philip is annoying his, fifth, annoying his daddy and Miss Periwinkle, who is one of the best fifth grade teachers in this count, county, then we had better take steps. Take steps, quavered Philip's mother. What do you mean by steps? Oh, it's very simple, said Mrs. Pigglewiggle. Have Philip come down after school and I'll give him a bottle of show off powder. For the next few days, sprinkle a little on him before meals, especially when you're having company and just before he leaves for school in the morning. I'm sure you won't have any more trouble. But what is this show off powder? Will it hurt Philip? Asked Mrs. Carmody tearfully. Show off powder is guaranteed to be harmless, said Mrs. Pigglewiggle, but it will stop, show it will stop showing off. You see, it makes the show off invisible. Invisible, wailed Phil's mother. You mean I won't be able to see my own little boy? Not when he's showing off, said Mrs. Pigglewiggle, matter of factly. Nobody will be able to see him, but when he stops showing off and is normal, he'll come back into focus. Are you sure, asked Phil's mother. Oh my, yes, said Mrs. Pigglewiggle. Now don't worry about it. Just send Philip up after, up after school. I know that everything is going to be fine. Goodbye and don't worry. But Mrs. Carmody did worry. She worried as she washed the breakfast dishes and tidied up the house. She worried as she made out the grocery list and sorted the laundry. But she worried the most when she was straightening up Philip's room. What if this powder makes Philip disappear and then something goes wrong and he won't come back? She sobbed as she took two apple cores, three funny books, and a slingshot and an empty box of Smith Brothers cough drops out from underneath of his pillow. Ew. Two apple cores underneath of his pillow. I'm going to stop right there because I think it's been a bit. And we'll catch up with this tomorrow. Friends, I hope that you're having a good time at home. I miss you so much. And I hope that this is one little way that we can come together. I hope you enjoy the book. I will keep reading. Bye.